It has been over a year since Ferdinand Marcos Jr. or Bong Bong Marcos came to power in the Philippines with Sara Duterte as his vice president. Marcos Jr. follows the presidency of Rodrigo Duterte, whose administration was marked by various human rights violations and excesses. Marcos Jr. became president with the support of Rodrigo Duterte, but does his administration follow the legacy of his predecessor? To talk more about this, we are joined by Dr. Delin De La Paz and Albert Pascual from the Health Alliance for Democracy. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Delin and Albert. Uh, if we talk about what the past year has been like for the Philippines, of course, the global media has often focused its coverage on, you know, the war on drugs or even U.S.-Philippines relations. But before we talk about that, I want to talk about this fear that was there when the when Marcos Jr. and Sara Duterte came into power, that their presidency could see a further weakening of the institutions that had started during Rodrigo Duterte's presidency. So can you tell us about that? How have institutions like the media have been impacted uh, in this past one year? Okay, so um, when uh, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. ran for presidency, we were really quite anxious that he's doing it for the wrong reasons, not for the country's benefit, but for his family's benefit, because there are many pending cases in the court against his family's uh, um wealth that were amassed during his father's um, presidency that were really illegal and it's still being questioned in court. And uh, there is also that huge amount of tax that they have not paid, the estate tax on when his father passed away that they were supposed to pay, but it's a huge amount that they haven't paid. And so it's really to wipe out the bad debts that they have and the to change so-called the history that the Marcos uh, presidency and dictatorship was the golden era of the Philippines. So in his campaign, he has been always talking about this. So we in the people's organizations were very clear that they were changing the history, that this is not what has happened during the Marcos, Ferdinand Marcos senior dictatorship. And there was a lot of human rights violations. We exposed this to the people, but unfortunately, they rigged the elections and so he won as president. And uh, during the, when he started as president, we already presented our demands. We had a people summit where we presented the demands of the people that even if we have not, even if we know that his presidency has been rigged, that's why uh, the elections has, has been rigged, that's why he became president. We, we knew that, um, we, it was like that, but we still had to present the people's demands. And one year after, we had another people's summit where we assessed the areas that we uh, looked into, such as uh, social services, economic policies, political policies, and uh, militarization, economic policies that include uh, foreign policy. We looked at it and it, we gave him a failure mark because he has not really uh, supported the needs of the people. Instead, there is worsening economic conditions of the people, worsening poverty, worsening malnutrition, and the graft and corruption in government has actually ballooned. And uh, the military is again in place. And to tap it all, he has uh, also collaborated more with the US such that there is increased U.S. military presence in the Philippines, which we are afraid will also attract um, possible conflicts from other countries. Yeah, and we believe that uh, because of uh, uh, different and systematic uh, fake news, uh, that's the reason why uh, he became the president. So it's a deceptive uh, campaign strategy by the Marcos administration. Uh, well, uh, he is now in power. Now, uh, after he, after his uh, inauguration speech, he made a lot of promises. Uh, number one, uh, he promised that uh, he will improve the uh, life of every Filipino. But uh, of course, uh, one year after, uh, 
we see that uh, this is not true because uh, if we look at the policy of the government regarding the economic policy, so uh, we notice that uh, there is no different uh, from the previous administration, like uh, he is uh, uh, still uh, in, in uh, focusing on the borrowings, the importation, and the intensive uh, financial investment here in the Philippines. If we talk further about the economic policies, there is something called the Maharlika Investment Fund, which has been very strongly opposed by social movements. Can you tell us about what this is and why it's being opposed? Yeah, uh, the Maharlika Investment Fund is supposed to be a uh, reservoir of funds that the government can tap on. but uh, And they look at the experience of other countries. But the experience of other countries is that these are excess funds of these countries and it's like uh, something that that you are have us on hand, like savings that you can tap on if you need resources. But what the Maharlika Investment Fund wants to do is to get the funds of the people, like the pension funds from the social security system, the pension funds from the these are from the private groups that have uh, paid their uh, social security taxes, the government service insurance system, which is for government employees, they're going to tap on these funds. And what will they use it for? And uh, as Albert was saying, the direction of the economic policies of government is foreign um, investment. They will be attracting foreign uh, companies to uh, invest here. But at the same time also, they will be using these funds for their own personal needs. So uh, the Maharlika Investment Funds also will tap on government agencies, um, budgets. And so it's, it's something that we are afraid will deplete our economic coffers much more than it will help in terms of investment. So um, the government will be investing these funds to all sorts of uh, business ventures that we know from experience have actually just uh, benefited the few of them, like uh, the president is current, uh, has not really appointed a secretary of agriculture. He has appointed one very recently, but it's not yet clear what the policies are. And in the past year, when the president was the secretary of agriculture, concurrently, president and secretary of agriculture, we had a lot of problems with our agricultural uh, conditions, like uh, many food, even onions, even vegetables were being imported and they cost so much at the expense of local development. They're not helping local farmers, but instead they are importing. And who is the importer? These are all relatives and cronies of the president. So it's really them who are benefiting from this. And they will use the Maharlika Investment Fund as their... Uh, source of investment. They will not be using their own personal money. But where will the proceeds go? It will go to them. It will not even go to the Filipino people. So a lot of people have really opposed the Maharlika Investment Fund. But unfortunately, because they control Congress, both the House of Representatives and the Senate, they have, this bill has been passed already and it just needs the signature of the president. And uh, if you talk about the sector you both belong to, the health sector, how has that fared under Marcus Jr.? What has been the impact on health workers? Yeah, uh, of course. Uh, well, uh, the Marcus administration at first, uh, a lot of promises to improve the healthcare system. Of course, uh, number one, uh, he promised to uh, hire more uh, health workers, most especially doctors in the rural areas and uh, build more hospitals to uh, to address the uh, lack of uh, health facilities here in the country. But uh, year after, uh, the, the Marcos administration do nothing about these promises. Well, in fact, the, the benefits of the health workers, uh, uh, the, the benefits of the health workers delayed uh, in his watch. So, uh, and um, the, the facility, uh, we don't see any any moves by the government to improve the healthcare system here in the country. Yeah, 
I'd like to also add that because hunger and malnutrition has a big impact on people's health, um, the health conditions of people have really deteriorated because of the increasing number of people who are hungry, hungry and malnourished. This is because the wages have not really been increased. They increase it to 40 pesos. What's that? It doesn't even it doesn't even allow you to buy a kilo of rice because a kilo of good rice is already 50 pesos. They will only increase 40 pesos per day. Uh, what kind of uh, addition is that to the budget? So uh, many people are really going hungry and because of hunger, many people are malnourished and because of malnutrition, many people are getting Ill. Ill. Even the ordinary uh, infectious diseases, which is viral, it ends up into a bacterial infection that needs antibiotics, but the medicines continue to increase in price. And Marcos was saying that he will decrease the price of uh, medicines, but uh, the studies have shown that the prices of medicines continue to increase also because we do not have our own drug industry. We have been dependent on imported medicines for a long time. So if the cost of medicines is expensive, um, in importation, then it will really add up to the cost. But why is it also like that? It's because the drug industry is dominated by foreign multinationals, drug, multinational drug companies. And even the local drug companies, they have also pegged their medicines at an expensive rate. And as Albert was saying, uh, the president promised better facilities, but it's not happening. Many of the hospitals, especially in rural communities, are there, but they are not equipped with proper facilities, nor do they have enough human resources. Many of the nurses are leaving the country because the pay outside of the country is much higher than what they get from here. Although the government is saying, oh no, because we have increased the salaries in the salary standardization law, but it, there are so many requirements for nurses to get into the government hospitals. So many of them would just rather go abroad. And also because of the understaffing, nurses are really overworked. And um, many of them also get sick. So they said rather than being overworked and underpaid in this country, they might as well leave. And that's a big problem. We have a lack of nurses and a lack of doctors. The, first, the hospital first, uh, building is there but there are no personnel, there are no equipment. And so the poor people, they're the ones suffering. In the end, when they're already seriously ill, they go to private hospitals and private hospitals are also very expensive. So um, contractualization among workers continue, especially in the private hospitals. They employ the nurses for only a certain period of time because they don't want to make them permanent because that would mean more benefits for them. So every six months, you have a change of uh, nurses and even not just the nurses, the nursing attendants, the institutional workers, they have been privatized to uh, private con uh, contractual agencies. So the hospitals are now being supported by workers who have not really been trained as hospital workers. It's only now that we have a Secretary of Health that has been assigned, but unfortunately, we also do not see him addressing the public health system. He comes, although he comes from the government hospital, but his trust has been very hospital centric. So public health, community-based healthcare has really been neglected under the Marcos government. And uh, we're also witnessing this uh, increasing presence of the U.S. military in the Philippines. So can you tell me about that? You know, we recently had saw the largest ever U.S. Filipino military exercises, and now U.S. is also going to gain uh, access to four new bases. So what does this mean? What implications is this going to have? For our military, it, it undermines uh, the Philippine military because U.S. military forces come in here. Actually, we have a visiting forces agreement. This has been um, signed several years back where we allow the U.S. forces to go to any place in the Philippines where supposedly they're going to train our local military um, soldiers, 
the basics of the new armaments. But what is the hidden motive here is to sell arms to the Philippines. So they will they will train our soldiers on the use of their armaments and they will sell this. So again, the U.S. Uh, being a, a war dictated economy, they're, they're importing, they're exporting their uh, war armaments to us and we are readily accepting them. And now with the EDCA, the Enhanced yes, Defense yes. Cooperation Agreement, Marcos has gone to the U.S., has spoken to President Biden, and they have strengthened the Defense Cooperation Agreement, the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement. And he has agreed to have nine sites of the Philippines as areas where the U.S. Uh, um, soldiers can come. And in the guise of training the Filipinos, they're actually training themselves in our terrain because we have a terrain that's very... Uh, similar to the terrain of the countries around Asia, and they again want to reestablish themselves as uh, the uh, primary country that has influence in Asia. And we are worried about this because of the Taiwan and uh, Beijing uh, this disputes. We can attract this dispute into our country because Obviously, the U.S. is also siding with Taiwan against China. So we can be drawn into this conflict because of this U.S. presence in our country. And this is something that we are very uh, worried about. And we are protesting the presence of the U.S. in these sites. We expelled the U.S. in 1991. There are no more bases here. But the Visiting Forces Agreement has actually worsened it because they can go anywhere. And this EDCA has identified nine sites that can be uh, attracting more of conflict rather than supporting the Filipino people. Okay, I would like to add, uh, yeah, uh, well, if you look at the background of the U.S. bases in the Philippines, as uh, Ma'am said, in 1991, the Senate, uh, rejected extending the U.S. bases in the Philippines. Uh, since then, uh, uh, they has no stop in finding ways you know, to return the weapons groups here in the country. So, as a brief background, in 1999, under the framework of MDP, the government signed the RP uh, Visiting Forces Agreement, and in 2022, the Mutual District Agreement. I just want to show the trend of the U.S. government uh, so that they can return here in the Philippines. So in 2014, they signed the Enhanced Development uh, Cooperation Agreement or the, or the uh, EDCA. Uh, then uh, if we ask question, uh, if is uh, the U.S. Uh, return in the Philippines is to uh, help the country or is the U.S. Uh, want to support and defend our territory? Of course not. Uh, after the U.S. was defeated in uh, in its war of aggression in the Middle East, the, the Obama administration began uh, rebalancing the military forces in the Asia-Pacific, mainly because of the uh, Indo-Pacific region has the most uh, abundant uh, natural resources. So uh, they ensured their uh, military presence here in this place. So particularly Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and the Philippines. So here in the Philippines, uh, like Mang Delen said, under EDCA, there is nine agreed location. And five were designated in 2016. And in February 2023, another four designated location was approved. So from April 18 to 28, uh, it held the biggest exercises in history, military exercises in history involving some 12,000 U.S. troops, so 5,000 and 5,000 Philippine troops. So I think uh, the, the, this uh, agreement disadvantaged the Philippines. Uh, first, uh, the stay of the U.S. forces in the agreed location is for free. Uh, under Article 3 ng Paragraph 3 of the EDCA uh, Agreement. So second, 
Uh, they do not have to pay taxes like fees for using water, electricity, and other public utilities. Uh, this is only an executive uh, agreement violating the Constitution. So uh, the, the Filipino people is uh, uh, rejecting this kind of uh, policy of the government, foreign policy of the Marcos administration. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, if we look at, you know, how things were under Rodrigo Duterte and how things are now, it also becomes important to look at the war on drugs. Of course, under Duterte, thousands became victims of extrajudicial killings under the guise of the war on drugs. Uh, how are things now? Has how are th How have things changed? First, the Marcos does not want to accept the International Committee who wants to come here and investigate the uh, the cases that the people have presented in the international court so that it can be investigated. They do not want to accept the investigators from the international uh, criminal court. Second, it continues the Duterte uh, policy of terrorizing the people and implementing the anti-terrorist law. In the anti-terrorist law, they will say that you are a terrorist if they have allegations on you, even if it is not, uh, it's not uh, confirmed. What kind of, how do they, how did they label you as a terrorist? People who are critical of the government have been red tagged. We call them red tagged when they always say, oh, you're communist. If you criticize the government, you're immediately labeled as communist. So we call that red tagging. And many of our activists have been red tagged. And it's so difficult to move around if you red tag because you're under surveillance. And there is that threat of death that they can just kill you on the pretext that you are a terrorist. And this is what has happened. And it continues to happen. Many of the communities have experienced um, strafing by military personnel. We have families. They wanted to, to uh, kill the, the father who they alleged to be working with the New People's Army, but they killed the entire family. They strafed the whole house. No questions asked. So we have communities that have been affected by this where families, even children, have been killed because of this um, militarization and abuse. And we also have, even among our health workers, the Duterte administration has killed Zara Alvarez, a nurse in Negros, as well as Dr. Mary Rose Sanselan, also a doctor in Negros, with no questions asked, only the allegation that they were helping the New People's Army. And right now, we also have several activists from the Cordillera region who have been tagged as terrorists because they were speaking against the continuous land grabbing by big business of the indigenous lands in their area. Their areas have a lot of indigenous communities and these are ancestral lands. But government is allowing foreign investors to bring their industry here, uh, put up uh, their companies in these ancestral lands. And this uh, activists have been very vocal against it. This is the Cordillera People's Alliance. And now they have been tagged as terrorists. What does it mean? They can just pick you up anytime uh, on the allegation that you, because they will equate terrorism to communism. And they can always say, oh, you're communist and you can be arrested. But that's not fair because activism is not terrorism. So um, it's a continuous abuse by the Marcos government from what the Duterte government has started. If we look at the uh, the records of the Karapatan, the human rights uh, group and human rights defenders here in the Philippines, I'd like to uh, share. Uh, in uh, This report came out in 2022 to 2023, so one year of the Marcos administration. So here, the extrajudicial killings, the number of victims is 27. Uh, prostrated extrajudicial killings, 22. Uh, we have enforced disappearance, uh, uh, four. 
Uh, there is uh, 11 victims of torture or illegal arrest, arrest without detention, 187. So illegal arrest, uh, uh, no, illegal search and seizure, 507. Physical assault, and on jury, 15. Demolition, 12,000, and a lot more. So uh, we bring this to the United Nations in their, uh, what do you call, anong address tawag doon, Magdalene? Yung... Uh, we bring these issues to the United Nations and uh, the United Nations is uh, seeking for uh, investigation that the Marcos administration uh, do not want to happen. So uh, I think, uh, like uh, Mom Dylan said, the human rights violation continues and it's very alarming because this is the state policy. So under these conditions, how are social movements organizing? How are they mobilizing? And what are the kind of actions they are able to lead on the ground? We continue with our education, our mobilization, and our organizing of communities because they have to understand that we have to continue to uphold our rights, especially our rights to health. And we have basis for this. We have the Philippines is a signatory to many of these covenants on human rights, etc. But the government does not follow it. But we have to continue to speak up. Although, of course, the threat is there. So we have some members who are afraid to join. But we still have others, especially the young. The students are very much uh, involved. They understand what is happening. They know what needs to be done. And so we have very good organizing at the level of the nurses. We have the Philippine Nursing Students Association. At the level of the medical students, we have the Philippine Medical Students Association. And they're quite there in the forefront, coming out with statements, coming out with uh, um, analysis. And they continue to organize in the different schools that, that uh, we are in. And in the communities also, we continue to organize the community health workers. In the hospitals, we have the Alliance of Health Workers that continue to organize the hospital workers. And uh, we are now preparing for what we call the SONA. Um, President Bongbong Marcos will give his State of the Nation address, S-O-N-A, on July 24. And this is something that we are also preparing for because we will give our state of the people's address. We will have a rally. We always have it every year because the conditions have not really changed. And in fact, it's worsening, but we have to speak up. So this is something that we are preparing for because we know people continue to suffer. People continue to uh, wallow in poverty. And it's all because of the lack of concrete, people-centered, political, and economic policies. Right. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Delin and Albert, for talking to us today. And uh, we hope to keep uh, talking to you in the future on more developments in the region. Thank you for joining us. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for watching People's Dispatch. For more such stories, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org, and follow our social media handles on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.